And then I'm the regional civil engineer at the Pacific Ocean Division here at Fort Shafter, um, Hawaii. Uh, my webinar today will be an introductory to LID, or low impact development. Okay, this is my agenda for today. And uh, continuing on with the agenda, um, the remainder of this presentation. Okay, so this is basically, um, I'm trying to provide a, a basic overview of LID and get you introduced to what LID is or low impact development. Um, as you can see, uh, LID techniques are actually more used on a micro level. They're a more small distributed scale type of um, uh, integrated management practices to capture more of the everyday storm events. Uh, it controls storm water at its source through interception, storage, and infiltration, mimicking how the natural conditions are had it not been disturbed um, through construction and development. Okay, and the natural hydrological cycle, which I'm sure many of you folks already understand, but uh, just to give a brief background on this, um, under natural conditions, rain is typically absorbed by the trees. Uh, shrubs, vegetations, and then um, streams and rivers and oceans. Excess rain, not quickly absorbed, um, normally infiltrates into the soil and percolates down and recharges some of the groundwater system. Whatever is left over is typically returned to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration, which is a combination of evaporation and transpiration through the trees, uh, plant uptakes um, through the trees, shrubs, and other greenery. Um, where it, Basically, goes back to the atmosphere and the whole cycle begins again. Very little runoff during this period um, occurs except under large storm events uh, under the natural conditions. Okay, why, why do we do LID? Um, well, in 2009, President Obama signed Executive Order 13514 to reduce water consumption implement water reuse strategies and implement stormwater guidance to meet ESA 2007, which is the Energy Independent Security Act 2007, um, Section 438, which I'll discuss a little more in detail um, as we go along in this presentation. Um, so we have uh, ESA as an act. It's a law. So we need to follow this and we need to um, basically implement some type of techniques to handle um, what ESA is stating. Um, for our Army projects, um, if you look at the fourth bullet down, the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Army um, provided a memo that basically stated um, for all our Army projects in FY13 and beyond, we are required to implement LID IMPs or Integrated Managed Practices um, for all our projects. So we should be at that stage at this point in our um, time frame that we're in now. Uh, and again, every project should be um, incorporating LID techniques now at this point to meet ESA. Um, there are some exceptions, again, which I'll go into more in detail as we look at the definition of what the paragraph 438 states um, as we go along. OK, continuing with um, why LID, um, there's some references that we've I've added to this uh, presentation here. Um, the, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers recently prepared the Army LID Technical User Guide for the Office of the AXM um, on Army facilities. It's a really good document. I looked through it, um, not in real detail, but I looked at what the contents had. It's, it's a very large document, maybe about 364 pages, but it has great information. It takes some of the latest um, things on low impact development. As we know, that's already, it continuously changes, and we're trying to always improve that, um, the techniques there. Um, underneath that, um, bullet there. I've also added a link um, to the USACE Hydrology and Low Impact Development site. It actually takes you to the USA Sustainability and Energy site and then it drops you into the Hydrology LID web page. Um, you'll have to register to access the site um, from what I saw when I went in there. But once you're in, um, you know, we highly encourage you to register for these sites because it not only provides information on hydrology and low impact but a lot of other good information in there. Um, on uh, energy, sustainability, HVAC, and a whole bunch of different um, topics uh, and basically centers of expertise that are listed there. 
But this ARNI LID Technical User Guide and most of the other references I presented on the previous page uh, can all be located in this one convenient site. So it's a really good um, site to mark down and keep for a future record. Okay, why do we really need to consider LID? Okay, we do have the ESA 2007-43, which is an act and a law, and we're required to do this. But really, why do we do it? We, we do um, LID techniques or LID IMPs basically because when we develop and construct and urbanize a site, we disturb the natural conditions, increase the impervious area, and concentrate storm runoff um, greater than the conventional uh, stormwater systems that we've done in the past. Um, You know, previous storm water controls um, like detention basins were designed to typically not increase the peak flow from pre-development levels, and that's um, from the largest storms, of course. And that's really what we were concerned with in design before. Um, however, you know, we found that there's no volume control when we do this. Um, volume still increases. Um, storm water released from multiple sites eventually accumulate downstream, uh, causing havoc. Um, we only design for the largest storms, like generally 50 to 100 years, and never really address the small everyday storms um, that occur all the time. Generally, we design on a site-by-site -site basis, just concerned with the peak flow rates released downstream of the property lines. Um, wasn't really a normally, a typically coordinated effort of the entire area. Each project was a site-by-site -site condition, and um, once we did that, we completed what we were required to do. Um, however, you know, conventional stormwater management practices caused increased flooding, erosion, scour, pollution, adversely affecting the environment and e ecological areas in um, the streams and rivers and waterways. It also increased uh, peak flow um, as well as volume, increasing the energy and velocity of discharges. Because previous stormwater designs typically address the peak flow rates and not the volume increases, we continue to see these typical problems occurring. Um, and that's really why we wanted to go and uh, start taking effect um, or in account these, um, trying to mimic the natural conditions on a small scale, distributed scale. So effects of development. Um, here we can see just photos just showing you how much of um, impervious area that we're adding to um, normally un undisturbed areas, right? Uh, we see a lot of forestation, greenery that's actually being disturbed. We see a lot of grading activities, compacting of the soil, um, new pavement, concrete, uh, urbanization basically. Uh, so a lot of development um, really changes the conditions of um, what was there before. Um, by doing construction, development, and um, Building up these areas, we typically see um, changes with the uh, hydraulics. Um, one of them, we see increased flooding. We also see point discharges and erosion, stream bank scour um, on natural waterways and systems, plant and tree uproots. Um, you know, when we see this, basically it just further weakens the stream banks leading to more erosion scar during the next storm, widening the channel, changing the physical characteristics. Basically, it just compounds the problem more and more as um, we see more failure along the stream banks. Another big factor is pollutants. You know, pollutants are collected in the runoff and washed into waterways. Um, petroleum, oil, and lubricants are pretty obviously as shown here in the, the um, upper left corner. I think I can do this. Um, in this lower corner here, it's a picture of increased nutrients, uh, nutrients um, like nitrogen or phosphorus, normally um, coming from sewage, manure, fertilizer, or landscaped areas, um, lead to weed and algae growth, leading to re reduced dissolved oxygen, killing fish, um, and so forth. Um, pollutants definitely adversely affect habitats such as aquatic life, vertebrates, insects, um, all within these riverways and uh, streams and um, ponds. This one, um, sediments, 
is also a big problem here. Um, we consider that a pollutant. It causes a lot of havoc, again, for aquatic life. It increases the turbidity and the total suspended solids of the water. Um, it settles in openings where fish lay their eggs. It actually um, is, you know, sometimes adheres to the skins of amphibians and other insects and um, reptiles around the waterways, again, causing more problems. Okay, what is uh, ESA 2007 or the Energy Independent Security Act of 2007, specifically Section 438? Um, well, you can go ahead and read that. I'm not going to read that for you, but um, it basically, you know, rate, volume, and duration is pretty straightforward on why we need to control that. However, temperature increases, that's another thing that we, is added here in, um, in the Section 438. Uh, Temperature can cause adverse effects, again, in aquatic life in and around the waterways. Um, you know, temperature runoff that runs off hot asphalt, concrete, sidewalks, and pavements actually increase the temperatures of the streams, rivers, and waterways. Um, a lot of fish are sensitive and other animals are sensitive to the um, changes in temperature that even a few or one or two degrees within that temperature change within the riverbeds and so forth can actually cause problems with um, the living organisms within those areas. So we're definitely concerned with temperature also. Um, the DoD actually has defined pre-development as pre-project, typical conditions of the project site just prior to project development. So this was something that we kind of looked at early on, and we had different definitions of pre-development, but now it's pretty defined. Um, the UFC also states this, that pre-development is pre-project conditions. <clears throat> so whenever we're working on a federal project that exceeds 5,000 square feet, that's disturbed area, could be um, disturbed horizontal and vertical areas, um, but any grading, um, building sites uh, over 5,000 square feet or larger needs to actually um, adhere to ESA 2007 section 438. And again, this is to maintain or restore the, um, to the maximum extent technically feasible, the pre-development hydrology of the natural conditions that were there beforehand. Okay, as part of um, Executive Order 13514, um, the EPA was uh, directed to develop a technical guide, and um, this is one of the early guides that came out to um, basically implement LID to meet ESA 2007 Section 438. So I've attached a little um, a link here that you can go in and, and basically click on it and get the uh, EPA technical guide and read through that. They give some good examples on how to calculate some of the um, option one and option two, which I'll, I'll go into on the next slide or so. Okay. Uh, okay. Within the EPA technical guide, um, they do provide two options to address um, on how we um, handle the storm events for um, lid. IMPs. Basically, option one is just retaining the 95 or 95th percentile storms. Um, this is something that we need to have generally long data for. Uh, the guide recommends 24-hour storm data for 20 to 30 years, ideally 30 years, but a minimum of at least 10 years or more. Um, and what we do is we calculate the 95th percentile, meaning that all storms less than and up to the 95 percentile will be addressed by whatever lid techniques we are using. Only the greatest storms, 5 percent, um, the last 5 percent and above, um, really um, needs to be handled in a different condition or a different way, which I'll go into a little more uh, as we talk more. Um, so that's the easiest way. We just, if we have the data, we just design to the 95th percentile, and then um, basically that's it. 95 percentile of a Storm duration will basically be something in inches, like 1.5 inch. Um, the lit IMPs are designed to contain the smaller, more frequent storms, as I mentioned earlier. 
Option two um, that the EPA provides is typically by um, like a continuous simulation modeling techniques using the old SCS or the what they call the NRCS now, TR55 methods or some other type of continuous simulation modeling. But you basically calculate the pre-development and then the post-development and you take care of that uh, difference between the two, um, again, in volume, in inch. Um, and uh, sometimes, um, you know, meeting the 95th percentile could actually be greater than um, option two. So if you do have those conditions and you know the pre and the post um, development and you do have that information, it may be worthwhile sometimes to try and calculate that out. And it may actually be less in some cases than what the 95 percentile um, is. So uh, something that's provided to you as an option. So you can choose either option one or option two. Option one generally is the easiest of them all. You just design to the 95th percentile. Okay, now going into lid IMPs or the integrated management practices. Um, basically, there's two types. There's non-structural and the structural. Non-structural is just what we do or what we try to address in planning and designs. Um, it's like reduced road widths, narrow streets, deletion of curbs and gutters, reduce sidewalk areas, etc. Um, we want to disconnect downspouts, uh, make smaller footprints, direct sheet flow through vegetated areas. Um, it's a lot of this planning and grading type of thing, trying to work this out. On the structural side, their actual, um, uh, what I included here was the most common methods, but um, we also include other types like trees and tree boxes, vegetated swells and bioswales, pocket wetlands, reforestation, protection enhancement of uh, riparian buffers and floodplains. Um, but I'm going to basically concentrate on these because these are pretty much the most common and um, some of the easier ones to um, address and do. So we're looking at bioretention, permeable pavements, green roofs and cisterns, or um, water reharvesting, recycling. Again, um, the purpose of the lid IMPs are distributed on a small scale control that increases um, rainfall interception and increases the time of concentration, basically slows down the um, runoff, removes pollutants, decreases temperatures, improves water quality, um, like the first flush. Okay, bioretention, um, basically it's a, it's a depression in the ground. Um, you dig it out and put amended soil and uh, build it back up. Um, it's used for storage, again, basically um, interception, storage, and infiltration. Um, rain gardens, which you may hear sometimes, are also um, a form of bioretention, but they're normally on a smaller scale. Um, Vegetated swells and bioswells act in a similar manner, um, so I've just included these all under the category of bioretention. Okay, so for some, this is a photo of a bioretention area in that center um, strip of the uh, road system here. Um, we can see that there's no curb or gutters. We want to make sure that all the water is directed into the bioretention area. Um, and basically it'll be stored and uh, help to recharge the groundwater system. Here's just another example of a bar retention area. Uh, again, we can use um, native plants or non-native plants. Um, typically, most city and county people want to use native plants, but I don't think there's any um, proven thing that says native plants um, are actually better than non-native plants. As long as they're still, um, you know, the right plants are used within these areas, then it, it should be fine. Another smaller bottle retention. Okay. In this uh, bioretention, we see that the you know there is curb and gutters, but they provide cutouts within the curbs to provide um, the runoff to actually enter the bioretention area. Here, what's important to notice too is that we see a graded system. Um, it could be back into this con uh, conventional stormwater system, or maybe even piped to another bioretention area if there's enough grades um, to it. But what it is, it's normally typically about 12 inches above the depressed area of the bioretention. 
Um, so only in the largest storms would you see that um, grate coming into effect. Anything under that um, grate would basically percolate down the ground and um, go back into the groundwater system. Generally, um, we typically design for about three to six inches of ponding, sometimes up to 10 inches or so. Um, the grate typically, again, is about 12 inches above the finished grade in most um, instances. Okay, a typical bottle retention diagram. You know, um, we see some with under drains, overflow inlet types. Um, some with under drains, uh, if the Drainage properties of the existing soil is not very good. We can always add under drains to help out, like a non-clay pervious soil um, uh, is a good type of soil. Of course, if we have clay material, then we might want to um, have more amended soil in there and also under drains to help um, drain out the system. Uh, amended soil basically is anything just added to the soil to increase its physical properties. It's a uh, you know. In, it increases infiltration, water retention, permeability, drainage, aeration. Um, there's organic or inorganic type of amended um, amendments, such as mulch, wood chips, compost, manure, grass clipping, sawdust. That would be organic. Inorganic would be such stuff like sand, gravel, tire chunks, natural or man-made um, that can be used. The storage area that we see um, basically would be the detention area. So the gravel bed generally would be um, what you want to make your storage area to be. So your storage volume that you're trying to store for the calculation of the 95th percentile storm or what, whatever you're working with, um, you want to make sure that you have enough storage area to detain the water once it comes into this bottle retention. Okay, here's another bottle retention in action. Um, you, know, you can see again it's ponding, hopefully um, we generally want the drawdown to be within two days, two feet of, um, I think two feet in two days is typically what we want to see. Uh, infiltration rates of about 0.5 inch per hour or more or greater would be great. Um, of course, the faster we can drain out, the better. Um, but um, what we don't want to see is standing water in a bar retention like days after a rain. Uh, this can lead to, you know, insect problems, mosquitoes. Uh, lead to requiring vector control. Also, anywhere near airfields and runways, um, we want to make sure that standing water is not present because of um, the bash or bird airstrike hazards um, that could occur also. Um, so again, when designing the bottle retention, it's important to make sure that you have the right infiltration rate, the right soils used to um, have a typical drawdown of at least two feet within two days. Okay, bar retention pros and cons. Um, again, pretty straightforward. Uh, first of all, the bar retention is pretty much the least costly of the four most common lid methods I mentioned earlier. Um, if you have the proper site conditions, space, soil, non-clay, favorable water table, you want the water table to be at least two feet, um, uh, ideally one to two feet below the bottom of the bar retention, but two feet um, would be the best case, of course, or more. Um, basically, all the lid IMPs that I'm discussing that I mentioned earlier reduces rate, volume, and temperature of runoffs, which in turn reduces adverse effects like erosion scour or habitat changes. Um, the bar retentions are typically designed for small storm events, two to five year storms, which is more of the everyday type of storms. Um, sediments in the bar retention area. We want to make sure that it doesn't get clogged up, clogging up the amended soils or the um, some of the gravel bed layers. Um, so uh, we sediments basically reduce the effectiveness of removing pollutants like the TSS, nutrients, nitrogen, and um, POLs. So we want to make sure that um, these sediments are actually cleaned off every so often, and we want to do these things by hand. Um, we don't want to compact the area and use heavy equipment or um, really stomp around in these areas. Hey Keith, um, before you move on, from the bar retention, we did get a question regarding um, the best plants to handle um, 
both the, the concentrated retention areas and the, and the inundation that results. Um, would those typically be, do we try to stick with native plants or, or are, we, are we just focusing on plants that can handle those conditions even if they're non-native? Um, I think, uh, you know, from what I've seen is that we, well, of course, native plants are going to be normally cheaper in, within the area that we're providing for. Um, but it doesn't mean that native plants are the only ones to handle that kind of conditions. If we can um, bring in non-native plants that work um, maybe even better, um, that should be fine too. I mean, we, there's no real preference. Um, I think some of the city and counties, at least for Honolulu and some other areas, we tend to try and promote native plants, but it really doesn't have to be native plants. I hope that kind of answers the question. Okay, continue. No, it does. Um, Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. So for bar retentions, again, you know, sedimentation is going to occur in these bar retentions. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, in addition to having some kind of maintenance, which I'll go into further later also, um, you want to, when designing, you want to at least assume some clogging over time um, and maybe provide some degree of safety factor when you're designing the size of your bar retention also. Um, uh, okay, and um, another thing to remember is that, um, especially for the maintenance people, these bar retentions look sometimes like an ordinary low depressed area, uh, non-bar retention, it could be anything. Um, we want to make sure it's designated out and the maintenance people know that it, it is a bar retention, normally non, um, very lightly compacted uh, amended soil and gravel. Uh, we don't want to be running over with heavy equipment um, that they typically use for their maintenance or even in the snow conditions. We don't want to make sure that, um, you know, they, the snow machines are kind of pushing off the snow to the sides and they actually just, you know, cover up the bow retention areas or, or go right over and start compacting the bow retention area itself. So um, it's very important to make sure that these uh, people that will be working in and around um, these bow retention day in and day out are aware of this. and um, that they don't provide the heavy equipments over these areas. Okay, the next uh, lid IMP that I'm going to talk about is permeable pavements. Um, again, uh, permeable pavements can be porous AC, pervious concrete, or even block pavers spaced in between porous subgrade as well as underneath. Um, it's basically a reduce or no finds mix. Um, they're best used for park, parking stalls, fire lanes, um, sidewalks, driveways. Sometimes they're used for recreational courts, um, basketball, tennis courts, stuff like that. Uh, not something we probably want to throw on at this point yet. Um, technology hasn't come up with the strength, I think, to um, put it on major roadways with heavy um, uh, HS20 kind of loading type of things. So typically we see these again in parking areas, um, areas that don't have the heaviest traffics. So this is an example of a um, pervious concrete. As you can see, there's hardly any finds in there. Um, more of a coarse uh, type of um, gravel mix. And again, when you pour the water through, it just uh, seeps right into a storage depressed area that can or cannot use maybe uh, Minnesota, depending on the soil types that are there already. Uh, example of a uh, just a paver system for um, small roadway area, looks like a landing area. Here's an example of porous AC. And an example of um, permeable pavement um, in use right here. We can obviously see that it's working compared to the concrete on the side here. Okay, typical permeable, uh, permeable pavement section um, consists of a choker course, approximately 40% void space. Uh, bed depth, uh, bed depth is based on the volume of storage required. Um, generally, we see a uniform graded material, not a well graded. We don't want to have um, all the voids filled up. We want to make sure there are voids within the storage area. Uh, 
another example of a typical section. Um, this one uses uh, is used permal pavement in a parking area um, and provides some river jacks, um, basically just smooth water wash decorative stones um, open to the recharge bed. It's just basically a backup area in case permal pavement um, kind of um, gets clogged up and doesn't work properly, starts to fail. Um, we have this uh, uh, redundant area that can actually um, overflow into here and back down into the storage area below. Um, we want to make sure that the um, slope all the impervious areas to these permeable pavements. Um, another thing we want to make sure is that we don't want to slope um, areas that may have erosion, um, silt, and sedimentation onto these asphalt areas or concrete areas of, of permeable pavement. Okay, permeable pavement pros and cons. Um, again, you know, like all the lid IMPs, it reduces rate, volume, and temperature. Um, it's generally the second most cost-effective method um, compared to the bottle retention being the first. Um, you still do have to provide some maintenance. Um, again, silt and sedimentation re removal is required intermittently to ensure that the porous pavement is not clogged and remains effective. You want to design for clean runoff, as I mentioned earlier. Don't let erosion and debris run off onto the permal pavement. Um, we don't want to drain off some uh, dirt or eroded areas onto these permal pavements. We also want to keep the grades in these um, permal pavement areas as uh, flat as possible. But of course, we have other things to meet, the ADA requirements and so forth. Okay, next uh, IMP that I'm going to discuss is green roofs. Um, green roofs is just basically exactly that. They uh, provide some kind of vegetation on top of uh, rooftops. It's uh, basically been used in Germany and other countries for over 25 years. Um, we uh, typically look at two different types. There's an intensive and an extensive um, green roof. Intensive, um, which I'm not really going to discuss too much because um, we don't really use these very often, especially not with our army projects. But it's uh, intensive is like a soil media depth of 12 inches more. Um, it requires vegetation three to six inches. Often requires irrigation. Of course, a lot more structural stability and regular maintenance um, for these types. An extensive green roof is a lot thinner profile. It's a soil media depth, um, depth of two to six inches only. Vegetation of two, two to four or five inches. Um, generally doesn't require irrigation, um, so I'm going to basically be discussing um, the extensive green roofs here in our presentation today, um, since that will be the majority of our projects. Uh, I also read somewhere that according to field studies, um, you know, increasing the green roof thickness may not actually improve the performance substantially, um, probably not worth the the cost basis of the increase and the maintenance required when you um, uh, for the performance versus the performance. So again, extensive green roofs are probably pretty much the way to go and, and easiest way to incorporate into a project. Okay, here's a typical green roof use. I mean, um, this one's like a little city park on top of a large building. Um, we can see that they're, they can be large scale like this one or small scales. A um, um, lot of different types of green roofs. We can have different shapes to green roofs, of course. It doesn't all have to be flat or it's just sloped. Um, this here we have like a round dome type of um, green roof. I'm not sure exactly where this one was. I just put it off the internet someplace. Here we see um, sloped roofs. Uh, even with slopes as um, steep as these, on these roofs, um, we can we can provide green roofs. Um, so again, something that um, can be used on a lot of applications. Here's a small scale type of um, green roof, um, just used for a, like a barn area or just one little house. Okay, so here's a typical green roof section. Uh, again, we're talking extensive um, green roofs here, not intensive. So they're pretty lightweight. Again, only three to four inches of um, material. Um, well, you can read what it says here. Uh, 
I know uh, more and more some of the city and county and states are looking into um, providing some of these as well as the federal um, providing some type of green roof systems. I think um, I read uh, back in February in the Honolulu Advertiser here in Hawaii that they talked about applying a green roof to the Hawaii State Capitol here. Um, I'm not sure if they said they were going to do it or if they're just looking into the fact that they're going to do it. But the, the idea is that it's it's gaining popularity. Um, when we can provide it, it will be a good way to um, implement another lid technique and green um, infrastructure technique here. Okay, this is just another typical green roof section. Okay, uh, green roof pros and cons. Um, again, basically the auto lit IMPs reduce rate, volume, and temperature. Um, this one can be, you know, we can we've seen in the pictures it can be provided on uh, slope roofs, um, very steep, up to at least 45 degrees. Can extend the life of the roof, um, reduce heating and cooling cost, traps total suspended solids pollutants. And then the cons, of course, um, we have to make sure that the structure is capable of handling the additional weight. <clears throat> if we have a lot of equipment on the roof, we have to take that into account. Um, and maintenance. Um, for uh, extensive types, there's not as much maintenance, but there still is maintenance. You have to do some hand weeding um, and checking that the vegetation is still growing properly. You want to check for roof leakages um, and roof structure damages that we so often also. Okay, cisterns and water reharvesting, recycling. Um, this is basically, cisterns are just large containers that we store water um, either generally from the rooftops um, of facilities or even houses. Uh, as far as um, the usage, we can uh, generally use them for um, non-potable systems such as irrigation and toilets even within a household. But um, sometimes they can be made into a potable system, but you know, like um, reverse osmosis systems. But they're, of course, it's not normally cost effective to do so. Uh, rainwater in general is considered clean water. It's not recycled or it's not even gray water. So it's um, typically pretty good. At least uh, we can use it for irrigation and, again, for um, uh, some uh, toilet systems. <clears throat> When we uh, capture um, the roof runoff into these cisterns, or later on we'll talk about rain barrels, um, we want to normally use them with screens for insects and other debris. We want to make sure that what's coming down the downspouts um, are not providing all the debris and silt and leaves that are going into um, the cisterns. So we want to make sure we have some kind of filtering system, at least, or screening system. Um, larger cisterns often incorporate some filter system of some sort, um, and then of course pumps that, are, if they're required underground um, cisterns, will require pumps for those. There's also above ground cisterns. So here's just a typical household type of use for or small facility for a um, cistern. Again, it's, this is an underground system. So it would need a pump system, has a filter, um, and everything is basically drawn from the roof through downspouts and into this uh, cistern where it's collected and then reused um, for um, whatever purposes that you want to use it for. Okay. Here we see a picture of a large cistern um, above ground. Here are some multiple cisterns. Um, I call these below ground, but they're kind of, you know, if they're completely below ground, I wouldn't have a picture for you. Okay, another example is just a simple rain barrel. These could be simple 55 gallon drum containers with a spigot at the bottom. Um, I've been, even seen some of these sold at Sam's Club over here uh, in Honolulu. Um, 
They're like a more decorative type, um, but they sell them here. We're, again, with just a simple spigot, gravity fed. Uh, downspouts go directly into the barrels, and then um, you can attach a hose and just water your um, plants and shrubs around this area within the limits of the pressure that's provided within this small height, though. They're very simple to use. It can be very simple and easy to install. Here's another example of multiple rain barrels. You can link them together through an overline, um, overflow line or pipe. Um, and you can, you can actually line up multiple rain barrels if you wanted, two or more. Uh, this was a photo of um, that came from the internet. It was in one of the papers, I believe. But it shows uh, one of our private schools here that um, went in and helped um, provide rain barrels to uh, some of the homes around here. Um, and just shows how simple and easy it is to, to incorporate some lid techniques into even our everyday uses. <laughs> Pretty much anyone or you know anyone can install and use um, one of these rain barrel types. The pros and cons. Um, well, pros a big one. Potable water normally used for irrigation, toilet flushing is can be now be eliminated or dramatically reduced with um, water recycling or water reharvesting. Um, there are some uh, maintenance issues again. We need to make sure that we clean out the screens from the debris. Larger systems will require maintenance on filter systems and pumps if used. Um, so again, these need to be considered into the project design um, and some of the maintenance costs for future use um, and O&M. And, and of course, um, you need to have a use for the water recycling. If you don't have a use, then of course this it goes without saying it wouldn't work. If you have no irrigation use or anything else that can be used with water recycling, this um, definitely would not be a good option. Okay, uh, just a lid um, integrated management practices summary. Um, you know, infiltration ground pr provides great groundwater recharge. It reduces impervious area, increases surface roughness, maximizes sheet flows, um, provides flatter. Well, we want to provide flatter swells and grades, longer flow paths um, to uh, increase the time of concentration and slow down the um, flow. Um, the first flush um, generally. Well, it's every state or city is a little bit different, but one half inch of runoff carries up to at least 90% of stormwater pollutants. If we can capture that, we take care of most of the pollutants that would normally have gone into the streams, rivers, and waterways. Uh, addresses up to the 95th percentile um, storms if we use using option one, of course. Uh, but larger storms, the remaining 5% may still be required to incorporate um, or reuse an existing stormwater conveyance system to protect life and property. So that's something that we need to keep in the back of the mind. We can't actually address normally um, the larger storms with these smaller distributed scale or lid techniques. Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, um, quite a few uh, maintenance um, things that we need to con be concerned about. There's actually be routine maintenance and um, non-routine maintenance here. So um, a lot of the systems, once they're built, and we know the working property fail because of the lack of knowledge or um, just the main lack of maintenance. So we need to make sure we educate and train the maintenance staff. We want to plan and budget for short and long-term maintenance. We want to make sure that no heavy equipment um, is used, again, on bioretention, bioswales. Hand maintenance is often pre preferred. Um, a routine, um, you know, it just again, it's it's a few times a year that we want to do routine um, measures. Rule of thumb for um, non-routine or major things, um, we want to probably look at some full re rehabilitation or rebuild in approximately 20 to 25 years of the life cycle. That's kind of like the rule of thumb here. Um, although this is fairly new, that's what they kind of say, but I don't know if we've had lid um, INPs that long yet, uh, not for 25 years. So um, generally, they say that's the rule of thumbs, but we really do have to monitor them and keep an eye on it. OK, 
Okay, um, this is an Army Lib planning tool. Um, this is page one of two. It basically inputs general parameters and calculates minimum runoff that you need to retain to meet the 95% uh, storm events. Um, again, if you can put in the, the inches for the 95th percentile rainfall, and you know your soil types too, um, you can determine roughly well, you know, what, what kind of runoff um, you'll need to retain on the site. So it, it, it's a good planning too. It's good for planning purposes, design, and just starting off the project. Now this is page two of um, the Army Lib Planning too. This here just shows um, if we plan to use potentially some types of bioretention swales, permal pavements, uh, cisterns, um, rain barrels, green roofs, uh, we can kind of get an idea with the right parameters again put in um, on how much we need or what size we need of these um, to accommodate what we calculate on page one, um, the runoff that we need to hold from the pre-development and the post-development differences or the 95th percentile. The uh, main thing to take away is I just want to introduce this to you folks, um, but there is, I just wanted you to take away from that, there is a planning tool, an army planning tool that can help you early on in the project at the conception. Uh, the link at the very bottom here, again, is uh, um, we'll take you to the UCA Sustainability and Energy site and the Hydrology Lib webpage. Um, this Army Planning tool can be found there, again, along with um, the uh, other documents that I had in the references early on in the um, presentation here. So I really encourage you folks to go in there, register for this site, and um, just browse around and see what's available in there because there's a lot of good information in there. Okay, construction considerations. Um, we all know, we always want to make sure we uh, take into account construction considerations here. Construction is critical to producing an effective working lid IMP. I was talking earlier about the maintenance that's after construction, but during construction, it's very imperative that we make sure that it's properly built. Um, we want to keep, again, heavy equipment outside of the IMP areas. Use light equipment or by hand where possible. Um, if you have to go in, you know, you really want to use the lightest earth moving equipment. Uh, maybe oversized tires, um, low pressure contact type of thing. You want to minimize compaction to the bottom of the IMP area when excavating. Um, if anything, apply lifts approximately 8 to 12 inches, lightly compacted to allow for possibility of excessive sediment. Not for compaction, just excessive sediment. Uh, we do not want to allow work on wet or saturated soil to prevent compaction. Um, and of course, you want to provide the lid IMPs, um, the construction of them as close to the end of the project as possible. So just some things to consider. Okay, well, um, I've provided some uh, point of contacts here if you wanted to reach me um, and also um, Laurie Arakawa who's sitting here also and Reynold Chan. Um, go ahead and feel free to contact us and uh, if you have any questions we can try and answer them as we um, get them uh, into us. And with that, uh, that's my presentation on low impact development and really uh, thank you for joining me here today. Uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them now and I'll see if I can um, answer them. Thank you Keith, that's a great presentation. Uh, we did get uh, a couple of uh, other questions, um, they were both having to do with the permeable pavement or the permeable concrete. Uh, the first from Paul, he asked, does frost or freeze damage uh, permeable concrete? Frost or freeze, um, you know, that I really don't know at this point. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer for that one. I haven't really seen anything on that and of course here in Hawaii we don't have frost or freeze um, conditions, but uh, we do have our Alaska district. Um, I, I would have to get back with you on that one. I have to look into Okay, that. thanks. Um, the other question um, also regarding permeable pavements, this one from uh, Captain Houston. He asks, um, is there any documentation about how well permeable pavements have held up over um, you know, 10 to 20 year time spans? 
Um, I think permeable pavements um, are fairly new, uh, new. I don't think we have that kind of data at this point yet that I have saw. Um, it, it is a question. Uh, we, we do have a lot of different um, companies and manufacturers that state that you know their product is the best. They even state that they can be used um, with heavy bearing type of vehicles. Um, but yet we, we have yet to see that. Um, uh, we, as far as the Army side, we again only been installing those uh, more on the non um, heavy bearing trafficked areas. Um, as far as again data um, going back to at least 10, 5, 10 years, um, I, I haven't seen that personally myself yet. Um, I think it's still fairly new where we're a lot of it uh, is just starting to get incorporated into our projects now. Um, a lot of them are more on trial basis. So we probably will be seeing uh, a lot more data on that in a few years to come, um, but really I haven't seen any in that um, length duration yet. Okay, thank you. We did get uh, uh, just a comment from, from Richard Schultz. Uh, he indicates that uh, Minnesota has a permeable pavement test program and uh, so it's been successfully used there in Minnesota with, uh, with freezing temperatures. Oh, great. No, no heaving or other problems that they've encountered. I guess. Yeah, we'll see if, if Richard uh, <laughs> well, terrific. can provide an update on that. Uh, we did get um, uh, we did uh, get uh, from Linda at Fort Bragg. She says just a comment that Fort Bragg has just completed a project with a vegetated roof, about 10,000 square feet, and it's expected to divert uh, about 6,000 gallons of stormwater annually. Oh, terrific. That is good. So we're seeing a lot more um, introduction of lid uh, IMPs into projects here. It's gaining a lot more um, consciousness, uh, I should say, and, and we're starting to incorporate them. We need to, of course, based on the um, memo that we had earlier, start incorporating these the FY13 projects and beyond. Um, but it is still fairly new, so, you know, Kudos to those who have actually started including them into the projects. It's a great thing. Um, based on those projects, I think we'll be provided a lot more data um, and hopefully good data um, in the near future. Richard did respond and indicate that uh, when designed properly, they did not have any heaving problems. OK, great. Great to know. That really helps me also. I didn't know that. Okay, do we have any other questions from the group? Again, you can either type them into the questions box or um, click the raise hand icon to ask them through your microphone. Uh, we did get uh, just a, another comment from Bill Sproul. He indicates that um, he's heard that some states do not allow the use of non-native plant species to be used when incorporating plantings on construction projects. Um, yeah. I think I've heard that before. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. I appreciate uh, your presentation, Keith, and, and everyone for joining us. Uh, just a, you know, another reminder that um, if you would like the AIA credits, go ahead and download the, the webinar quiz there from the file share box and return it to either Lindsay or I. Um, and we will return with our uh, next presentation, which will be two weeks from today at the same time. Thank you again, and uh, we'll go ahead and sign out from this present from this webinar. All right, thank you.